and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, and things to come when we get a couple of clues about that. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and a writer about music and musicians for The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and several other publications. I'm joined by my regular esteemed co-hosts, uh, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hey, Alan. Hi, everybody. And Darren DeVivo, who, if you're in the New York area, or even, I guess, online, uh, you can tune in to his shows on WFUV. One of the, I guess, last remaining really classic stations in the New York City area. Well, we are uh, one of the, uh, I guess, last... uh uh, radio stations in the New York City area that kind of has that old school classic approach to it, going back to the old FM free format days, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, I guess you could say that. And you can listen anywhere in the globe, uh, not in the globe, but on the globe at WFUV.org or the, our app. And in the New York City area, it's 90.7 FM. Hello, my friends. And it's more White Album. That's right. <laughs> We're. Continuing the discussion from last week about the White Album, but first, we have some news items. Ken, over to you. Okay, first of all, uh, Ringo Starr gave an interview on Howard Stern Show. This was on November the 27th, last week, and he revealed that he is working on a new album, which is just amazing. Uh, when and if that time does happen, it would mark his 20th studio album. He and Joe Walsh were interviewed together. And they mentioned writing a new song, which has the lyrics, you gotta get up to get down. And as we know, his last album was called Give More Love, and that came out in September of 2017. Ringo's co-producer, Bruce Sugar, posted a photo of Ringo and Steve Lukather in the studio together, with Steve holding up his copy of the new remixed White Album CD. Mm -hmm. And also, as far as Ringo's concerned, on, uh, I guess it was that same day, November 27th, Ringo, wife Barbara, and Olivia Harrison arrived on the red carpet at the annual UNICEF Snowflake Ball. And Ringo was honored with the George Harrison Humanitarian Award. And Ringo has made a video in which he's asking fans to make a donation to UNICEF, as this, of course, was, uh, you know, a big cause that George was involved with going back to the concert for Bangladesh. And if anyone is interested in making a donation, they could uh, they can go to the website UNICEF USA slash Ringo and make a donation. More news here. Both Paul and Ringo went to see Bob Dylan in concert. That was last week when Dylan played the Beacon Theater in New York City. Mm -hmm. But they each saw him at separate shows. <laughs> Uh, Paul saw him on Saturday night, Ringo on Monday. Ringo tweeted, thanks for a great night, Bob Dylan at the Beacon. Rock on, peace and love. So it's a shame that uh, neither one of them went up on stage with Dylan. Mm -hmm. But uh, nice to see uh, their support of him. Yeah, Paul and Dylan could have done some stuff from either Kisses on the Bottom or one of Dylan's 75 albums of American songbooks. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I would welcome that. Sure. Also, uh, last week in the UK on Television Channel 4, they aired a new documentary called John and Yoko, Above Us Only Sky, on the making of John's Imagine album. And um, it includes interviews with, among others, Klaus Vorman, Elliot Mintz, Julian Lennon, David A. Ross from the Everson Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. And I know that our very own Alan had a chance to see it. Yes, so, I did. what did you think of it? Um, I thought it was great. Um, it was done by the same people who did that Lenin NYC documentary a few years ago, I think around 2010, when the uh, last remastered box set of Lenin stuff came out. 
And that was a very good documentary. This is too. Uh, and it fits into that, you know, bunch of stuff that we were talking about a few weeks ago about the Imagine Box. You know, there's the there's the box set, there's the book, there's the now deluxe mm. book, which my copy of finally turned up. And there is the Give Me Some Truth and Imagine film together on a Blu-ray. Now there's this. Uh, and it's like yet another little piece of the jigsaw puzzle. And one thing this thing offers that the others don't, and it's I, I don't know that it's that significant in itself, but it's just like another incremental thing, is it has current interviews with a lot of the people who speak in the book. And in the book, we just see them as they were in 1971. In the current interviews, you see the same people today uh, and, you mm -hmm. know, also get their perspective of, you know, them looking back at what was going on at the time. And it just has, you know, more info, you know, slightly different perspective on the same info that we had and there is some audio and video that we haven't seen before, you know, yet more footage from the filming of the Imagine movie, uh, which made up the basis of the Gimme Some Truth documentary, too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's tons of that stuff. I mean, and this has some more of it. Can't think of any particular scene that I thought was, you know, striking enough to mention, but... There, there is a lot of recording studio footage, and, and including, I think, some takes that we haven't heard before of, of quite a few of the songs. So it's one of these things where, you know, if you are a fanatical collector, uh, what we used to call a bootleg collector, although bootlegs these days, you know, everyone just sort of does them and puts them out there for free. But, you know, what someone will have to do in the relatively near future, I would think, is take the audio off the film and sort of catalog the takes that we haven't had before and add that to the whole bunch of Imagine stuff that we just got and all the Imagine stuff that we've had all these years. So, you know, more is good. More is more. So you can... You can tell from these different takes that they're different from what's on the box set because we were treated to a lot on the box set. Yeah, because, you know, there, there are different starts and stops and different comments made in between them and, and that kind of stuff. You know, just stuff I haven't heard before. So, uh, mm. yeah, so I, I, I think there's a, there's a, a little bit of, um, you know, new material there and every little bit that we get we're closer to the ideal, which is the complete master tapes of everything sitting in my house. <laughs> now, well, you got to wonder, with this being produced, why didn't they release that here at the same time with all the other Imagine stuff? Uh, why was this Why was this strictly for a British yeah, uh, TV broadcast? Yeah, that's weird. That, that is weird because the Lennon NYC thing was done here for PBS. Mm. This, so, you know, it's conceivable in a couple of months we'll, we'll get a PBS version of it. But also, um, one of the co-producers with Channel 4 and Sky in the UK was Eagle Rock. And Eagle Rock is in the business of putting out Blu-rays and DVDs. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a release of this at some point in the relatively near future. Yeah, and they were the ones that put out the, the Imagine Give Me Some Truth DVD Blu-ray anyway. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's Alan, right. How, were you, how were you able to, to see it? Well, um... <laughs> <laughs> I see. see. See how he gets around this. Yeah, you know, it was, well, it was broadcast in the UK, and it was available for online streaming in the UK, and... Once something gets onto a computer, no matter how much supposed protection they put on it, there is always a way to get it. So let's say some little elves out there manage to download it in very, very high quality as a TS file, which is basically a Blu-ray file, uh, and sort of made it available to people who were interested. So I was mm. interested. <laughs> yes, that's the, 
Thir- that stinks because I don't know any elves, so I'll have to wait. To- <laughs> Something okay. uh, as uh, a program like this that, uh, you know, I, I have heard other po- very positive things about it. The, the chances of it remaining something that us here in the States can enjoy, I find that hard to believe. So I would imagine, like Alan said, sooner than later, I'm sure it'll be popping up somewhere. Yeah, I mean, Mm -hmm. Eagle Rock's involvement, I would think, pretty much guarantees that. But, you know, who knows? It it seems likely, though. This sounds like something I could see on PBS, Mm -hmm. you know, during their pledge drive. So, but we'll have to wait and see. Let's hope that it does come out here. All right. Uh, In other news, Paul McCartney has agreed to play his first show in Ireland in nearly 10 years. And this will be for a charity concert. He'll be raising money for the homeless for an exclusive concert at uh, Vicker Street in Dublin. The last time Paul played in Ireland was in December 2009 at the O2 Arena there. And uh, Paul was inspired to do this because of a plaque that was unveiled commemorating two shows the Beatles did at the Adelphi Cinema on Middle Abbey Street, November 7th, 1963. Instead of selling tickets, guests will be asked for donations and proceeds will benefit the homeless. No date for this event has been set yet. Paul continues his Fresh It Up tour with dates this week in Vienna and December 12th at the Echo Arena in Liverpool, returning to Liverpool, uh, December 14th in Glasgow, and December 16th at the O2 Arena in London. And Paul continues to recognize Record Store Day and just put out a limited edition 7-inch vinyl of his recent single, Come On To Me and I Don't Know. Copies of this are numbered. Do you have a copy, Darren? I have three. <laughs> okay. How and about I you, Alan? Remember my numbers. I actually didn't even notice right away at the numbers, but I did. Uh, I was lucky enough to get uh, three copies. I just got mine. Mm-hmm. You know I, what I? I know you guys copy this. Did you get yours, Alan? I have only one. <laughs> actually, I have two at the moment. One is for Adrian Sinclair, my co-author on the McCartney Legacy Project. So it doesn't really count as me having two. I think, but I managed to get my hands on too which is difficult because in record store day at least here and uh darren if you went to bull moose you would have had that problem too they confine you to one purchase uh of any record store day product i found that out the hard way when i tried to get extra copies of penny lane and strawberry fields a few years back you not only can only buy one but you have to have a Bull Moose loyalty card, which I had, but when you have the Bull Moose loyalty card, it goes into their computer showing everything you've bought. So when they told me you could only buy one, I thought, okay, I'll just go to another Bull Moose store, which I did. And they said, you got your card? And I said, sure, here's my card. And they said, you already bought this. <laughs> hmm. so, so this time, in order to get one for Adrian, I brought my little sister who was visiting and got her to get a Bull Moose card so that she could get the only other copy of it in the store. Well, I and- live in the uh, New York metro area, but was in uh, in Maine, a stone's throw from Allen's pad on Thanksgiving. And on record store day, I ventured out to the, uh, I believe it was uh, 12 Degrees, uh, that morning, uh, and uh, went to the Bull Moose in Waterville, uh-huh. Maine. But by the time I got there, which was, I don't even remember if it was 11 o'clock. It was earlier than that, I think. It was at 10. But uh, there was very little activity around the record store day releases, and there wasn't any constraints put on. Nobody said anything to me that it had to be uh, one, unless it was that was just for the people who were waiting when the stores opened. They didn't want people clean, cleaning them out from the beginning because when I got there, if I wanted to buy a duplicate copy of something, no one said I couldn't. I only was able to get the one copy of the McCartney single at the uh, Waterville Bull Moose, and I got the other two from uh, another dealer. So, uh, uh-huh. but, uh, but I'm a proud ca- uh, card-carrying Bull Moose person now. Uh, good. <laughs> This was something that we expected him to release in this form in the summer when it was announced that it was a double-sided single, and yet there was no any-sided single available. Remember? Mm. Right, yes. 
So yeah, I also heard about a deluxe Egypt Station box set that there has been no word on, which is okay. Give me a chance to get some money back. Yeah, really. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think we, he wants us to first buy the catalog reissues, the Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway, and then we can have more Egypt Station stuff. Mm -hmm. right. I'm sure it'll all be next year. Yeah. All right, just a couple more items. I know both of you know about this, but just released as an album of all jazz cover versions of songs from Sgt. Pepper mm -hmm. called a Day in the Life, Impressions of Pepper. It's on the legendary Verve label, and it features 12 contemporary jazz artists covering the songs from Sgt. Pepper. So do you both have it? I have the vinyl one uh, that was in the record store day bin, so I picked that up. Yeah, well, it was that there. came out as a, as a record store day release on vinyl. I don't know what, if it's available on CD as a regular uh, release, or maybe it's coming out. I could be wrong. Maybe it's been out already. But uh, I definitely want to get my hands on that. I haven't been able to yet. Hmm. Okay, very good. Well, I'll be curious to know what uh, both of you think of these new covers, as I will try to get a copy myself. Okay, okay. and uh, finally, uh, on the Billboard charts, the Beatles' White Album already drops. It goes from number six to number 30 hmm. on Billboard's top 200 album charts. I'm returning my so. MBE. <laughs> <laughs> well you know that's that's the chart life of um you know any new release from a veteran act most of the people who want it get it you know in the first week or two that it comes out and then uh it goes down the charts fairly quickly yeah that's certainly what happened with egypt station mm -hmm. i mean i think egypt station was only on the charts we're talking the top 200 here i think it was only on for five weeks and that was it it's already off Mm -hmm. after debuting at number one so but hopefully the white album will stay on a bit longer we'll have to wait and see so why don't we get on to uh our main topic okay i thought you know we, before we get on to we we were up to discs four five and six really but i was wondering if either of you have reconsidered anything that you had said last week or had you know different thoughts or things on the topics we discussed last week which were the easier tapes the remix etc that you had forgotten to say and want an opportunity to say now i after we recorded our last show i was uh a little annoyed at myself because I felt like I, 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 I might have come off as saying that I, I didn't like the, um, the new remix of the White Album, which is absolutely not what my point was. I, I like it a lot. But again, perhaps because the new mix is like the least exciting aspect of the White Album reissue, for me at least, uh, and I think I think it's safe to say, probably for many folks, when you when you have all the Easter demos, you have all of the outtakes that we're going to talk about tonight uh, on this show. The remix of uh, of the original albums is a little less. The novelty wore off on one listen, uh, and I think from you know nine times out of ten, when I go reaching for the white album i'm going to listen to the classic mix that we've known for 50 years that's available on the 2009 reissues but still i mean there's there's a lot of value there in this this new 2018 mix but just that it seemed a little a little underwhelming standing alongside the demos and all the outtakes and stuff like that um and i even wondered if they're should have been I'm making the deluxe box set bigger than it is already if there um should have been cds that had the original mix included as well so you can have uh, a fan who is a more casual fan maybe splurges uh for the box set and maybe gets it as a gift you have the classic mix uh you have the brand new mix which you can a b and then you know go to the demos and and the outtakes, but I just felt like uh, the new mix is great, but ultimately will kind of end up under a layer of dust compared to the, you know, the uh, the classic version of, of uh, the White Album itself. Yeah, I, I think it's safe to say that 
nobody who does not work for either Universal or Apple really is that invested in the new mix. I really enjoyed the new mix too. Like I said last week, I love the clarity of the instrumental timbres. Um, I love the things that you can hear that you couldn't hear before. And it's, you know, and it's, it's a good alternative way to hear the album. You now have three ways. You can hear it in mono. You can hear it original stereo. You can hear it in the new remix. And that's fine. I, I think if they had put CDs of the, say, 2009 um, remaster or even a new remaster into this box set, you would have heard people screaming about how they're making you buy two discs that you already have yet again. I think what mm-hmm. would have made more sense, maybe, if they had put the original stereo mix, as they did with the original mono mix, uh, in high definition on the Blu-ray. But I don't know how much space there is on a Blu-ray for them to do that and you know what was available. But that would have made sense. Then you wouldn't have been made to pay for an extra two discs and you would have had the blu-ray as an archive of the remix the 1968 stereo 1968 mono and let me say one more time to anyone underwhelmed by the new mix just three words or one number (laughs) (laughs) 5.1 Yeah, well, I have uh, mixed feelings about it. I'm very happy to have any new mixes, you know, as long as the original mix always stays in print. And it's nice to be able to hear in the new mix instrumentation and separation of instrumentation with such clarity. But then I also have to ask myself the question, and I have to admit that part of the reason I'm influenced by this is by what we discussed in our last show about what Chris Thomas had to say about the mix that when the Beatles were making this mix, they were concerned about making a great record. Whereas, you know, there's a difference between what you enjoy hearing on the radio and on your stereo. And when you're getting a new remix like this, and there are certain certain times when I'm just blown away by by just how clear it is, Mm -hmm. it's almost too perfect. It's more like you're in the studio with them, as opposed to just the experience of listening on your stereo or, you know, listening, uh, you know, the old-fashioned way as I used to do when I was a kid on my transistor radio <laughs> to, to Beatles records. That was how we grew up on them, you know, and this is a whole new experience altogether. You're getting closer and closer to the way they were in the studio, and maybe we're getting too perfect. So, I don't know. I'm starting to question that right now. But at the same time, it's, it's breathtaking to hear certain things so clear and so much in the mix And uh, like I said before, to hear Ringo's drumming so clear, where you may not have heard it that way before. Then again, I could also hear people say, there was nothing wrong with the original mix. You don't touch the Mona Lisa, that kind of an attitude. Um, So (laughs) there's so many ways to look at it. You know, I understand the purist attitude. I understand people who wanted to, to want to hear more improved sound. So this way you're getting the best of both worlds, as long as it's, always available okay here's something that um that i always find sort of mildly amusing i guess um either that or irritating it 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 depends what mood i'm in but in a lot of the um groups i frequent on um you know various corners of the internet you have people who you know once a thing like this comes out will do everything they can to get more isolations of different instruments. And there there are ways now you can do it on your computer. You know, it used to be that you could take a stereo LP and, you know, with wiring, you could take the hot uh, side of one channel and the the positive side of one channel and the negative side of the other, and you get a a third channel, basically, with out-of-phase stuff. And that was always really interesting to listen to now with a computer you can do that multiple multiple ways and uh and so something like this comes out it's a new remix and so the stereo is different so the out of phase stuff will be different plus there's the 5.1 which people were able to get isolations from and then get the out of phase stuff from the isolations so everyone has been getting all of these isolated instruments and voices and things and making their own remixes some of which are kind of radical 
And yet, in some cases, you run into the same people saying, well, I don't really like what Giles has done. And it's, it's kind of like, wait a minute, if it's official, it's not good by definition. If we do it ourselves, it's better. Now, in, in a lot of cases, that may be true. <laughs> But um, but I, I I'm a little puzzled, I guess, by the suspicion of the official stuff when basically they're doing a much more conservative version of what everybody is now doing now that they have their own isolations. You know what I mean? Right. Am I making myself clear? Yeah, it's very hypocritical. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like we're talking about what Chris Thomas said about the Beatles being concerned about making a record, they obviously weren't thinking about 5.1 sound in those days. Right. And yet, now we're getting all this isolated, all the isolated instrumentation, and there are people who are loving that, you know, and that's fine with them. Uh That's not the way the Beatles intended. (laughs) Right. So. But it's great to uh, have. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not doubting that. Yeah. I would like to say just one thing about the Esher demos, because um, I remember years ago, I did an interview with Richie Unterberger, mm-hmm. who wrote this book, uh, what was it, The Unreleased Beatles? Mm-hmm. And there was one question that I asked him at the time when the book came out, and I said, if there's anything that's never come out on the Beatles that you think deserves it more than anything else, what would it be? And he said, the Esher demos. And for years, I agreed with him, because it's so complete although you said there may be more than the 27 demos here. But, I mean, to have 27 all on one disc is absolutely wonderful. And, you know, it's nice to hear a version of Sour Milk Sea with George Harrison singing it. It's nice to hear an early version of Circles, which is very different from the release version that George made. There's so many reasons to like the Isher demos as one package. It's really great. It could have been sold just by itself. As one disc, mm-hmm. I feel. Yeah, I must admit oh, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes the double tracking kind of gets on your nerves a little bit because they did it with just about every single song. But like I said before, it's nice to hear these songs as they're being developed, and then uh, comparing that to these outtakes and what still hasn't been, you know, added to the the, the arrangements of the songs. You see them in these developmental stages, and it's really fascinating to have it all at once like this, you know, on one disc. I, I, I really, you know, overall, I appreciate the outtakes more than the demos, but the demos still are an amazing treat to have all packed together on one disc mm-hmm. like this. Mm-hmm. I think if we didn't have the demos before, we would be thinking of the demos in exactly the same way we think of discs four, five, and six, you know? Mm. Well, yeah, I, I yeah, because they've been so widely bootlegged. Hardcore Beatle fans probably know most, if not all, of the twenty-seven, you know, that are now legally available for the first time. Mm-hmm. But uh, the outtakes are, are, if there is ever an instance that you have three CDs in front of you packed with music, and you're done listening to the third one, and you're like, boy, I wish there was more. <laughs> it was it was these these uh, outtakes uh, in the deluxe box set. Mm-hmm. So, Darren, what were your, what were the highlights for you among the the final three discs? Well, I there was um, there was a few really uh, chill inducing highlights for me, and you know the one I think that I don't know why I gravitated to this, but it was hearing "Can You Take Me Back" in the context of how it was just kind of ad libbed in the studio. Now I don't know, I should know this. I don't know if Can You Take Me Back is a song that McCartney made up on the spot at that time, that day, in the studio, or if it was a kind of a little more of a formal song that was maybe half written that was sitting around and Paul just kind of broke into it. Do either one of you have any ideas on that or do you think it was just a one off kind of ad libbed performance? I think it was probably one off. I mean, it may have existed for Paul as a song he was working on, but we don't have any other examples of it that I know of. Right, so. yeah. yeah. I, didn't think, I didn't think so. Well, when I first heard the White Album, I was, if I remember correctly, I was 11. And it was when I got received it as a Christmas gift, I think in 1976. 
So it's uh, or or maybe 75, 75, 76, whatever. Uh, there's many kind of surreal moments on the White Album. At least they were to my for my ears as a, a kid, an eleven year old, give or take a year, listening, discovering this music for the first time. There's many otherworldly surreal moments. The whole vibe, even of the White Album, it seemed to be coming from a different plane. And I carried that with me my whole life. So when I listen to the White Album today, uh, a lot of the uh, vibes that I picked up on when I was a kid, hearing it for the first time on my phonograph, a lot of those same feelings and vibes stayed with me through the years. So I always found that uh, that bit at the end of Cry Baby Cry, which I only found out maybe in the past 10 years, 15 years, was uh, a, a songlet called uh, Can You Take Me Back. I always thought that that was very otherworldly, surreal, and even a little eerie. Where all of a sudden, maybe because I knew Revolution 9 was coming in a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. But it seemed to come from a different place. Paul all of a sudden singing Can You Take Me Back, where I came from as it gradually fades away. Now, hearing now here on, uh, on the box set, and all the outtakes, you get what I would assume is the entire session, or at least the complete session of where that segment was clipped out of and put on the original album. And it's just interesting to hear that bit of Can You Take Me Back in context with everything else that was going on at that time. Mm -hmm. And hearing Can You Take Me Back is actually a two-minute-long song, or whatever the... the the length was but it's actually a light-hearted session mm -hmm. paul kind of plays around a little bit while he's singing it and then towards the end he just goes and you could tell you recognize it he goes into the uh the section that's used on the white album uh and then the song breaks down that just i found that so fascinating hearing that performance and hearing it amongst other uh bits of looniness like uh, Los Paranoias, yeah. which was something they broke into before Can You Take Me Back, but it was, you know, at the same performance. Elsewhere, hearing the, uh, the kind of bluesy, early, very early rehearsal of Let It Be. Many of us didn't even know Let It Be was something that Paul had uh, had written at this point, and uh, it was, and, and, you know, and had no idea that it was done to the point where it could be even brought to the table during a session. Well, there it is, Paul breaking into this new song he wrote, Let It Be. And it was kind of, a, again, a different, more kind of hard, slightly harder edged, bluesy uh, approach to the song as opposed to the ballad version, which we uh, know. And uh, right off the bat, Revolution One, the full uh, 10 minute version of Revolution 1 and hearing how once it faded out on the album back in 1968. Well, now we hear it continuing on for another six plus minutes. And you hear all of uh, John's vocalizations that end up being used in Revolution 9, hearing them in the context on, uh, of where uh, they were created is really fascinating and a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's mm -hmm. just a handful of many highlights that jumped out at me on my first couple of run-throughs of uh, those three uh, outtake discs. Hmm. Okay, Ken. Interesting. What jumped out at you first? Oh, my God. There's way too many. <laughs> I, I have to start by saying that, um, just to make sure I don't forget to say this, but one of the biggest highlights overall, and you're going to be surprised to hear me say this, was everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey. And the reason why is because you have two different versions on this box set. You've got the, the Isher demo, which is acoustic, and it has a completely different feel to it altogether. Mm -hmm. And it really works well as an acoustic song. Mm -hmm. And then on the outtakes, it's an instrumental jam which is really cool. <laughs> and I, I like, you know, how they played it. They didn't develop it into, they didn't uh, have the, um, the riff that you hear at the very beginning of the release version 
And I just found that really interesting. And, you know, for those of us who crave some instrumentals of the Beatles jamming, Mm -hmm. this really works very well. So I agree. It's a really good point because, you know, this is not a take. This is an unnumbered rehearsal, as they say, on it. And that on this one and other unnumbered rehearsals, they are really tight. Now, this is a band that hasn't been on tour for a couple of years and only saw each other to play in the studio, basically. I mean, they did have some time in Rishikesh, but... The time they had in Rishikesh was with acoustic guitars. These are electric jams. And, you know, with Ringo with his drums, which I don't think he had in Rishikesh. So, uh, you know, it's it's kind of really eye-opening to hear the state of the band on these rehearsal takes. That's one yeah. thing that this set gives us that I don't think we've really seen before. And, and, yeah. and you've also got to figure that I would assume we heard, you know, we heard some evidence... Uh, on the Sgt. Pepper box set last year, uh, that this is probably the first significant period of time that the four of them are together in the studio where they're playing together. There was a lot of individual performances and overdubbing and Mm -hmm. for Sgt. Pepper. So you got to go back to the Revolver sessions for the last considerable chunk of time that they were together playing as a four-piece. And um, here you, you hear them in 1968, and they were a great rock band, mm-hmm. you know. And I'm glad you pointed it out. Everybody's got something to hide, Ken, because mm. I thought the same thing. And there's other moments scattered, sprinkled amongst these outtakes where you hear no singing, or the sing- singing maybe is a rough vocal, or it's in. The, you hear what a tight band they were. Right. Yeah, and for for those of us who who love those few instrumentals like flying or 12 bar original, you know, and you want to hear the band just jam. This really works so well. I wish there was more of this stuff. Yeah, I really do. It's another plus for Ringo because at the core of a good band and a tight jam and a band that seems right on is the drummer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it really is another little subtle example of how good a drummer Ringo was. Right. There's another one of these, which is the sort of jam uh, incomplete bit of You're So Square, Baby, I Don't Care. You know, the Mm. the old Elvis, etc. hit from the 50s. And they give a really sizzling performance of that, and it raises an interesting question, which, um, you know, sort of related to these other jam things where we haven't really heard them playing this way under these circumstances studio conditions all that stuff you know two years after they stopped touring and it's surprising how good they were all we really knew until now was the let it be sessions which are you know pretty much all available on the the nagra tapes you know we know pretty much everything that they played at that session and i the when i played you're so square baby i don't care which is probably the first thing i played when i got the set um (laughs) i kind of thought well how come they are giving such a sizzling performance here in late 1968 and in january 1969 they're jamming on these oldies and it's so anemic and not together and And because of that, I I had always thought, okay, you know what? One thing the Beatles weren't is a jamming band. And it turns out maybe they were a jamming band, but something was really wrong in January 1969. Well, you know, it's kind of like what they say about the Let It Be sessions. There's probably a huge difference between the Twickenham sessions and what they did at Apple Mm -hmm. because they were, you know, supposed to be very unhappy at Twickenham and things changed a bit, you know, they picked things up and they were more spirited, you know, when they were in at the, uh, Apple, uh, studios, Mm -hmm. but some other things that I wanted to point out, and this, this should be obvious to everyone are the different takes of good night. And it's really interesting to hear all the Beatles singing the song together and harmonizing. And just to know that they attempted that in the very beginning, and it's it's very nice to hear that way. And um, I must say that one thing that kind of turned me off when I first heard about this, and actually Darren and I went to uh, a listening session in New York and we got to hear this, 
and all of us in this in the studio heard it for the first time and people are writing this is the version they should have released you know <laughs> it's fine when it's something all entirely new to you and it's great to hear them all singing together if the version that we've known all along with the wonderful orchestration that george martin added had been kept from us and that was on this box set we'd all be saying that's the one that should have been released but um you know, it's I really. Know. I don't know. I think we might be saying it's a good thing that they picked the one with the backing vocals and the electric guitar rather than the strings because the strings makes it sound a lot more mawkish than it ought to be. I don't know. I think it's perfect I, the way it was. I love many, the orchestration on Good Night. For many years, I thought Good Night was supposed to be a kind of a tongue in cheek, they're smirking at each other in the studio way of ending the album these outtakes and that version that you're pointing to Ken, makes you realize that it was a ballad beautiful ballad that is you know right up there with some of the greatest things that john john and paul wrote but for many years i thought it was kind of like with the with the syrupy uh muzak arrangement that the finished version got that mm. it was meant as uh, kind of a half of a joke way of ending the album when now i realize no good night was serious from the get-go they were they were serious with this song this was not something that was being set up to be kind of a little playful uh in joke or something at the end of the album yeah no i think it was a perfect way to end the album and there were some radio stations that actually sometimes at the end of their broadcasting night they would close with good night mm -hmm. so uh you know, I always thought that the uh, the orchestration from George Martin was fantastic on that. And then there's the other take of Good Night, which is just Ringo singing to piano and percussion. And we actually got a taste of this on the Beatles anthology, but that version they cross faded into the release version. This is the full version, and it's wonderful just as it is. You know, it's really a beautiful song, and when you strip it down to just vocals and a piano mainly, you realize even more how beautiful the melody is and uh, it's just a great song. So I was very impressed with that. Um, so many things here. Don't Pass Me By I wanted to bring up because um, I know that when the Beatles anthology was released and they had that, that extra track on volume three called A Beginning, mm -hmm. which is the instrumental that George Martin wrote and it was done with the intention of being an introduction for Don't Pass Me By, I would then go and combine the two just to see what it would sound like. And you got that here, although it doesn't have that very beginning piano intro from Don't Pass Me By on it. It's um, This is an interesting uh, outtake here. But what I found most interesting about it overall is the way that it ended. Because you heard Ringo saying the words, this is some friendly. And for years and years, we heard this title as a working title for Don't Pass Me By. And I couldn't figure out why it would even be called that. You know, there's no lyrics in Don't Pass Me By that says this is some friendly. But he's saying it at the very end. So maybe that's why it was written up for many years as a working title. Sure. Cry Baby Cry is very interesting. It's a, it's a slower, bluesier version, which I think works very well. It is interesting to hear the early versions of Helter Skelter. It's a bit trying. You know, I don't know how many times with repeated listenings you could listen to. This was 12 minutes of it. It's very slow. And I don't know if Paul is just trying to feel his way through the song. But it's slow and gritty. And I like it for that reason. I just don't know how often I could listen to it because of the length of it. So many things. The first take of Hey Jude is wonderful. It's fantastic. It, it's pretty close to what they ended up releasing in the first place that early on. That's so funny because uh, t a couple of things you just said, I have written on my notes here almost word for word uh, how you just said it. Uh, <laughs> I was amazed that Hey Jude, in its infancy, still clocked in at close to seven minutes with the big na-na-na ending in place and Paul doing all the uh, uh, vocal calisthenics. Uh, so that was in, I guess, in place in a uh, part of the plan from the very beginning with Hey Jude and Cry Baby Cry being a, a bit of a blues in that uh, other version. And one mm. more thing, actually, uh, I, I thought of here was uh, 
before I forget this, I want to mention uh, there is a, a an outtake uh, of uh, of Blackbird, and at the end of it, Paul was talking to a woman in the studio, and you hear the woman's voice, and I wonder who that was. It's Francie. Was it Jane? Oh, it's Francie. Okay. Yeah. That she, I was wondering if it was Francie or Jane, uh, but he Paul is uh, conferring. You know, basically discussing the take with this person in the studio, and you clearly hear, you know, a woman sitting right next to him, and she's giving her opinion as the outtake ends. Well, better than that, actually, if they had given us the video that they ought to have with this album, um, there is video of that session with Paul sitting there playing, and you see Francie sitting off in the corner. This was part of uh, the video that Paul made to promote Apple. You've seen it, I'm sure. It's, it, yeah. it's there's a scene of them with uh, you know their publisher with uh, with Dick James. Um, there's the scene of Paul in the studio. There's some footage with Mary Hopkin. And during the sessions, when Paul flew to America, it was to bring that film to a Capitol convention on the West Coast and play it for them to sort of give an idea of what Apple was going to be all about. Right. Mm-hmm. So you yeah. can actually see her in there. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time because I want I want to know uh, your favorites, Alan. But just a few more things I'll bring up. the The instrumental backing track for "Back in the USSR" was interesting because we learned that it was done one key lower mm-hmm. and slower. So we never knew that before. I don't know why they needed to do that. But um, that's how it was recorded. Just to know that, I found interesting. I like the other take of the faster Helter Skelter. That was really electric. You know, a lot of energy on that version. I really got to appreciate uh, some of the backing tracks. Like uh, Martha, my dear, has a whole different feel to me without hearing the brass and the strings. So uh, you get to hear Paul playing the piano throughout. And it's basically just, it's Paul and George Harrison's playing guitar on on the track, because Paul's actually drumming on Martha, my dear, I believe. And John wasn't at the session. Um, So that's all that you hear on that particular take. Um, And Savoy Truffle and Honey Pie, I love to hear the backing tracks for those. Honey Pie sounds so wonderful just hearing, you know, the orchestration and... and, uh, the brass instruments and woodwinds and how perfect that was as an arrangement. Kudos again to George Martin on that. Hearing Savoy Truffle, the backing tracks is great. Oh, going back to Honey Pie, you hear a little bit more of John's lead guitar mm-hmm. on uh, the backing tracks there. That's just a few of my favorite things. But why don't we get to hear yours, Alan? Okay. Um, so I, I agree with a lot of yours. I love those backing tracks. Um and as Darren said, the rehearsals, I was looking for things that you guys haven't mentioned, but I do want to talk about Revolution, uh, Revolution 1, take 18, partly because, the, you know, I mean, having just come back from talking about the Revolution trilogy at the, at the Monmouth Symposium, um, you know, it's obviously strongly in my mind. This take of Revolution 1, I I, I really appreciate the fact, and I don't know if he did it on purpose or even cared what was out there on bootlegs, but, you know, we've had take 20, which is the same take, but with a lot more overdubs, um, mainly on on the last bit. And so you can see what they were doing i mean here it's the the first thing they're recording during the white album sessions and they're taking like two or three sessions to overlay this zany stuff onto the final six minutes of a 10 minute piece and you're you're wondering you know well what are they doing? I mean, we know that they had all gotten together and done these demos. So George had a bunch of songs. Paul had a bunch of songs. John had other songs. But they're taking three days to do this. And Take 18 is great because uh, you you can hear what was going on from the very beginning of the process. I mean, Take 18 was the keeper, right? And it is the basic track on which they then worked further. You hear Paul singing Love Me Do at about seven minutes in. 
um, <laughs> a, a, a whole verse of it. You also hear, you know, uh, Yoko had brought in some tapes and was playing tapes of, you know, things like her saying you become naked. All that was, was pre-recorded. She brought into the studio and sat in there and played it. There also is a very obscure thing that made it all the way through to the Revolution Number no. 9 final version, which is a recording of a Syrian Egyptian singer named Farid al-Atrash. Um, he had a, a, a big hit in the Arabic world uh, called um, Abul Hamsa. And that is, you know, what a lot of people take as an operatic recording in Revolution Number no. 9. But Farid al-Atrash is already here in Take 18. You can hear it, you know, towards the end. And uh, and I thought that was kind of fascinating because I've got no idea how they even came up with that record, you know? Um, huh. So, yeah. If, if it's what I'm thinking of, it, almost, I always thought it sounded like John singing. Yeah, but it's not. It's huh. like, yeah. And uh, so so we really get like a, a great idea of the basis of this thing. You hear some Mellotron sounds. You hear all kinds of stuff that doesn't make it to Revolution 9 and some that does. Then when you go to the bootlegged version of Take 20, you hear so much more. Um, and so uh, having Take 18, which we didn't have in any form before, uh, is is really uh enlightening um and then when they move on to the fast revolution we have here an unnumbered rehearsal right and that was when paul and george said yeah not fast enough to release as a single and so john comes in about a month a little more than a month after recording the original and says okay we're doing a fast one the unnumbered rehearsal it's really kind of a funky version, you know, with clean guitars. And I, I really love it. I would love to hear a full take of that version. But they didn't get around to really recording it until the next day when they did what John really wanted, which was distorted guitars and, you know, a really much more menacing sound. But um, I'm, I just love listening to the playing on the unnumbered rehearsal because it's just kind of a cool little funky version of it. And and maybe they should have recorded it that way too. The the question would have been whether he when it when you talk about destruction whether he would have wanted to have been in or out because that verse isn't included here, so we don't know. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Hmm. I want to ask you a question because since you're talking about revolution, I found it interesting that on the Esher demo, it's much more up tempo mm -hmm. than Revolution Number One. It's right. more mid tempo and bouncy. Why did they decide to go from that? to slowing it down. Yeah, I don't know. I think my guess, and totally a guess, is that, you know, what John wanted to say in that song, in that version of the song, which at the time was the only one on his mind, was that, you know, you want to talk about revolution, let's think about this. And so it's kind of laconic, it's kind of laid back. He sang it lying on the floor, for God's sake. Um, mm. And you kind, it's kind of dreamy in a way so because the revolution from his point of view is really far off we're just discussing the whole question of you know what is this going to mean we want to see the plan you know and then you know revolution number nine it's not really number nine Every, we always say that but revolution nine is the revolution itself it's sort of the portrait of basically the violence and destruction and everything that he is saying he doesn't want to be part of. It's kind of his warning of, you know, okay, you're really going to have a revolution. This is what you're going to get, you know? And in between the single version of revolution with the distorted guitars and, you know, that's, that's kind of like, okay, this is now beyond the sort of dreamy discussion phase. Now things are getting a bit dangerous and that's the you know part waypoint towards revolution number 9. So I mm. think I think the first one was so slow because I think that put forth that particular version of his message most clearly. It's like just sort of a dreamy uh yeah, we're talking about revolution but we're really just discussing it at the moment. We're not really doing it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just wondering. Yeah. Yeah, that's my thought about it <laughs> yeah. um 
I like all the While My Guitar Gently Weeps outtakes. I mean, we've got the Esher demo, uh, which has some a verse or so that we don't get in the finished version. Uh, we have the other acoustic version that I think nobody knew was even there. Um, mm-hmm. And the other take of the electric version, which is, you know, has a different Eric Clapton solo. Uh, and was actually, I think they used take 25 and this was take 27. So they already had the keeper, but they were still trying to improve on it. And that, that take breaks down with George trying to do a Smokey Robinson vocal move. And, you know, which he mentioned, which he says what he was trying to do. And I think that's interesting, uh, too. One of the most interesting thing about outtakes, I mean, outtakes by nature are, you know, the ones that weren't good enough to finish or, you know, made a mistake, some reason not to have put it out. And a lot of the time on these outtakes, you get people saying exactly what went wrong. And that's kind of interesting to me, too. Uh, Mm -hmm. Not Guilty. Never been crazy about the official versions of Not Guilty. I mean, when it came out on bootlegs years and years ago, and it was only in mono, and it it was okay quality, but not quite like this, but it seemed to to sizzle a bit more, especially the lead guitar part. And on this version and the one on the anthology, both the same take, because I think Take 102 is the only one with vocals, it just doesn't sound quite as as punchy as the bootleg used to. So I don't know why. don't know why there's a difference there, but because um, it's the same take. John's two versions of Julia uh, towards the end of the set really like mm. those, partly because, you know, again, you hear him talking about, you know, what he's thinking as he's doing this, and, and he's concerned having only recently learned to finger pick from Donovan in Rishikesh, he's concerned about whether he can sing it and finger pick it. Not sure why he's concerned because he already had done the Isher demo and that was finger picked and sung, but maybe he overdubbed yeah. the vocal. I don't know. But so first he plays it with chords, you know, just block chords and it's, mm-hmm. it's kind of nice, you know, but then he does it finger picked and it's, you know, it's really good. Um, what else? Yeah, I think you, you guys have mentioned a lot. The inner light Lady Madonna across the universe. Not always happy to have outtakes of anything, but not sure they belong here. And if they belong here, then we should have had outtakes of Hey Bulldog as well, which was... Well, mm-hmm. I have a theory. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a dinosaur. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I have EMI all figured out, folks. <laughs> you, you notice, by the way, that when the Sgt. Pepper box set came out, they didn't include only a Northern song. Right. And now on the White Album box set, they didn't include Hey Bulldog, which was recorded the same time as Lady Madonna and The Inner Light, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And also, remember that nothing's been done at all for Magical Mystery Tour, except that Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane were included on Sgt. Pepper. Mm -hmm. Or the other songs recorded in 1967, which ended up on the Yellow Submarine soundtrack, It's All Too Much, and All Together Now. So I have a feeling that they're compiling these songs these leftover songs between Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine for some kind of a release. Because uh, if they... I'm sorry, they're doing a real music box set. <laughs> well, that's only, that's only from two films. But think about this for a second. If things continue the way we think they will, with Abbey Road coming out next year and Let It Be in 2020, if they're going to go by the important anniversaries... In other words, the 60th anniversary of Please Please Me, that wouldn't be until 2023. Okay? So you got those years in between. So maybe they're thinking about putting out something in between there with those songs. Because it makes no sense to have Lady Madonna and the Inner Light on here when they really had nothing to do with the White Elm. Mm-hmm. And across the universe, for that matter. Although that's a really nice acoustic version Mm -hmm. of across the universe just john and acoustic and nothing else uh so i just think that all these extra tracks that have been left off 
have been done for a reason. That's because you could, have, you could have said only a Northern song just as a bonus track as it was recorded the same time as the Sgt. Pepper sessions. That mm -hmm. could have been on the Sgt. Pepper box set. Why wasn't it included in there? And what did Giles Martin say? Well, that was on Yellow Submarine. Okay, fine. <laughs> but now you've got Hey Bulldog not in this set. So I think something's, something's being planned there. That's just my theory. The Inner Light, uh, that was uh, pretty much all done in Bombay, right? Uh, right. In, in the beginning of 68. Yeah, mm. I didn't understand why it was included. Yeah, no actual uh, Beatles on it, really. <laughs> yeah. And we've heard that. But that's been released before. It's was on that the George Box. The Wonderwall music. Was a there was a bonus that's track. Right, with the, that's right. With that's the, right. Uh, backing tracks yeah. there. Yeah, I'm getting confused. Right. Mm. Yeah, so it was kind of, it was a little bit of a, huh? The way the box set ended. The way those, uh, the three uh, rarities, uh, the uh, rarities, the three outtakes, uh, outtake discs ended with those three tracks. But uh, again, rather have them than not. Yeah. I also think that if they were going to give us the outtakes of those, they should also have given us remixes of the, the finished tracks and uh, probably the videos of Hey Jude and Revolution. I mean, we've had a remix of Hey Jude, but I don't believe we've had a remix of Revolution and certainly not a surround mix. So I think if the outtakes were going to be there, we should have had the finished product too in, the, in all those cases. Yeah. Mm. So for me, though, anytime you hear any of these alternate takes and the arrangement's different, or you hear something being developed in the song that wasn't there before, or something missing. Like, I, I forgot to mention the continuing story of Bungalow Bill, mm -hmm. which is pretty close to the release version, but they didn't have the All the Children Sing part. Mm -hmm. They didn't develop that in the song yet, so it's everything but that. So I find something like that really interesting. The only time that I'm disappointed at all, and there's only a few things, is if there are versions that are pretty close to the originals with very little difference. Like that version of Blackbird, which is nice to have, but it's you know pretty darn close to the original. So it's not as interesting to me. Mm -hmm. even, anyone, something, uh, even something like Mother Nature's Son, um, this alternate take doesn't have the brass on it. Now, on the release version, there's only a little bit of brass, but I guess it must make a difference. Because by itself, just Paul and an acoustic guitar and nothing else, it has a different feel altogether. To me, anyway. And then I have to admit, I'm not the biggest fan of Los Paranoias. <laughs> I mean, um, and I could listen to it once or twice, but I know it's the Beatles having fun in the studio, and we should appreciate it for that reason. But I, I can't take it as a you know a serious piece of work. What about uh, and and I know we're running out of time. One more thing towards the end of uh, what would that be? I guess disc six. Uh, long, long, long. Did anyone mm. catch that at some point after, I guess, the first run through as, you know, as, as, as it's breaking down, George starts strumming My Sweet Lord? No, I didn't I, hear that. Listen to Long, 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 and you'll hear that once the, the take, I don't know if it's, I don't have my, uh, the track listing in front of me, if it's, uh, referred to as a rehearsal take, but, um, George is strumming away on his guitar, and you hear uh, the opening, what ended up being the opening uh, chords of My Sweet Lord. So, uh, hmm. you know, G George probably had that, you know, in the back of his mind, the song he was working on at the time, and it just kind of came through at that at that point when uh, they were working on Long, Long, Long. Interesting. I have to listen to that again. Yeah. Huh. Okay, so that was um, part two of our discussion of the White Album. We reserve the right to return to it at some future point. But for now, I think we've covered the whole box set, uh, the demos, everything that goes in there. And uh, the, oh, the one thing we didn't talk about was the vinyl. Um, oh, okay. I listened to some of it. I, I didn't listen to the whole thing on vinyl. I listened to the first disc. Didn't really make much in the way of direct comparisons with the digital but uh you know it, it sounded great i think you know my complaint about the vocal timbres being a bit too sharp edged on the uh, cd maybe 
is addressed a bit in in the vinyl. I think the vinyl sounds slightly warmer, but vinyl often does. I mean, that's just one of the one of the qualities of a, a good vinyl pressing. And this is very clean, uh, hundred eighty gram vinyl. And uh, the only other thing really is you know what comes with the vinyl. I mean, you don't get the whole book, which is kind of a pity, but you do get Paul's note and. Uh, I think Giles Martin's note and some very condensed uh, Kevin Howlett notes. But on the Esher demos, on the four disc set, uh, you get the custom Apple, Apple custom pressing labels for the demos. You know, what would have been an in- internal label used for acetates or other sort of internal Apple stuff. So I thought that was a nice touch too. I guess that's it for this episode, and uh, we'll go around and get our contact information. Uh, and I'll just start with how to contact us as a group. Uh, that we have a, an email address: things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. We love to read your comments. You can follow us on Twitter at at sign things we said fab. We have a Facebook page, which is Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans. And you can reach me directly at, on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, Darren? Uh, easiest way to get through to me, uh, if you want to send an email, is to contact me at, at WFUV. My email address is my full name spelled out. D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O at W-F-U-V dot org. Or if you go to Facebook, uh, look for the page called Darren DeVivo on W-F-U-V radio. And you can uh, like the page and uh, then we'll be hooked up and uh, send me a message there. Okay, Ken. Uh, You can reach me at my email address, which is every little thing at att.net for those of you that want to hear my syndicated radio show every little thing you can find archival shows at the global texan chronicles.com website just click on beatles and many of my shows are right there my website is kenmichaelsradio.com and as i always say you can find beatles trivia every single week where you can win one of nine great prizes. And I have a brand new prize to give away, which is Ken Mansfield's brand new book called The Roof, The Beatles' Final Concert. I just did an interview with Ken, which is on the website on interviews page four. And now on my Beatles trivia page starting next week and part of a special contest on my website starting this week, you can win his new book. Ken was the former... U.S. manager for Apple Records, and he talks in the interview that I did all about his time working with Apple artists and with the Beatles and on being on the Apple rooftop for that uh, historic concert. So again, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. One last thing, don't forget my other podcast show. It's a video podcast called Talk More Talk. Most of the time on the solo Beatles, but we're continuing with the talk on the Beatles White Album. You can catch us uh, most Tuesdays, um, although that's going to change to Monday very soon. But uh, the latest broadcast will be on Tuesday, which is December the 4th at 9 p.m. Eastern. And that's with Kid O'Toole. And Tom Hunyadi and myself, Ken Womack, our other co-host, won't be able to make it for this show. But uh, we'll be talking all about uh, the White Album, Part 2. And uh, that's a live video podcast on the Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And that's it. All right. Okay. Ken Womack may be White Albumed out by now. (laughs) (laughs) So... Uh, for Darren DeVivo and Ken Michaels, I'm Alan Cozen saying thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Take care.